Hey there, welcome to this lecture. This is the oxygen isotopes in lakes lecture series, and this is the third lecture uh, with the focus here on lake hydrology and isotopes. I'm Matt Finkenbinder, I'm a geologist and professor at Wilkes University, and also uh, Dr. Jonathan Dean uh, helped write these lectures, and he's at the University of Hull. Okay, so topics that we'll cover in this lecture. We'll first off um, briefly review the various processes of lake formation. Then we'll talk about the water budget or the hydrologic budget of a lake. <clears throat> then we'll discuss how we can classify lakes as either being closed basin or open basin. And at the end, we'll talk about the <clears throat> isotope hydrology of lakes and <clears throat> how whether a lake is either closed or open basin will ultimately be a dominant control on the isotope chemistry um, of the water in that respective lake system. And so in short, we'll talk about the controls, um, what, controls uh, what controls the isotopic composition of lake water, and how that is in turn related to lake hydrology, and how we can then interpret um, or, or use that information to learn something about climate conditions. All right, so at the outset, briefly just talk about lakes and how they form. Um, <clears throat> lakes are very simply basins or low-lying areas on land. <clears throat> we know that they fill up with water, the figure, uh, but they also end up filling in with geological materials or sediments over time. And it turns out that they're relatively short-lived features um, over geological timescales due to rapid infilling of those materials and sediments. There's uh, a number of processes that can end up forming a lake, and so we'll talk about lake origins here briefly. <clears throat> um, we can see uh, on this table here, we've got the origin on the left column, and the number of lakes and the uh, total lake area, and then the corresponding percent total area for each of these categories. So <clears throat> the first one listed here is glacial. Turns out that most small, shallow lakes form due to the processes related to either glacial erosion or glacial deposition. <clears throat> and so we tend to see uh, a lot of lakes in the mid to high latitudes in places like all throughout Northern Europe and Asia, and also in North America, <clears throat> in the Northern US and Canada. And that's because these are regions um, and that during the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, were covered with um, alpine glaciers, mountain glaciers, or large continental scale ice sheets. The second origin or process uh, listed in the table is tectonic. And so here it turns out that most larger or much bigger and deeper lakes form due to plate tectonic processes, and in particular, the process of rifting. And so rifting is uh, where the, uh, the continents or the landmass would be pulled apart. <clears throat> that ends up uh, causing the land surface to drop down and to form uh, basins or depressions. And then we have a whole bunch of other processes. <clears throat> you can see that we've got coastal origin, uh, riverine or fluvial, volcanic, and also uh, what they're calling miscellaneous. <clears throat> and so all of these other processes, uh, they can end up forming a lake although uh, they're really not as abundant and as important as either the glacial or tectonic lakes. So some of uh, what I would call relatively famous lakes that I can think of are in uh, North America, the Laurentian Great Lakes um, in the uh, Midwest US and Southern Canada. And we've got the East African Rift Lakes, and then uh, in the UK, we've got the English Lake District Lakes uh, in Northwest England. So lakes are great for a variety of reasons, um, recreation, things like fishing and boating. Um, but because I, I study lakes, I'd also say that they're great for uh, studying past climate and trying to understand long-term change. Next, we're going to talk about the hydrology of lakes. So we'll focus on the water balance of the lake. And so very uh, basic first order questions that we want to think about are first, what contributes to water in a lake? And so how does the water actually arrive there? Where does it come from? And then second, how does water end up exiting or how does water leave that respective lake? 
And so we can construct a, a basic water budget, uh, which is a function of changes in storage. And that's equal to the sum of inputs subtracted by the sum of losses uh, of water from the system. So when we think about water inputs, and then we could um, think about three primary inputs to most lakes. So first we would have um, precipitation. And so in the uh, water budget equation here, we have delta S, change in storage, is equal to P, which is precipitation directly falling on the lake. And we would then add in R sub N. So that refers to surface runoff into the lake uh, via a stream or a river flowing into the lake or it could come from just hill slope runoff into the system. And then we have GWM, and that refers to groundwater uh, flowing into the lake itself. And then we have a series of water losses from lakes. And so then we subtract out R sub out, and that refers to surface runoff out of the lake via an outlet stream or river. We also subtract uh, GW out, which is groundwater through flow. And then we have minus E. And in this case, E refers to evaporation, uh, where water is lost from the lake directly up into the atmosphere. OK, so it turns out that changes in either these inputs or these losses due to climate change will result in changes in the water level of the system. So what's being shown here is this condition when we have wet, uh, wet conditions. So if we have greater inputs of water in comparison to losses, and that would coincide with, let's say, wet, humid conditions. And in that case, we might have uh, what I'll call high lake levels, uh, where the water level is very high, and perhaps we have overflowing conditions. The counter to that would be uh, if we had drought or dry conditions. So in the case of dry conditions, the uh, uh, in this case, the water inputs would be less than the losses, or there'd be greater losses than inputs. <clears throat> and this might result in a reduction or lowering of the water level in the system. <clears throat> and we might recognize that by seeing, let's say, an exposed shoreline or the outer rim of the lake that previously was a beach might now be actually summarily exposed um, above the actual water level. Okay, so continuing on this discussion, we can then classify lakes depending on their prevailing hydrologic conditions. And we can refer to a lake as either being closed basin or we can call it open basin. And so the block diagrams here are showing examples of what that might look like. So in the upper left, we have a closed basin lake. And so in the case of a closed basin lake, we have pretty low lake levels, and there's no surface outflow. And so in this case, water doesn't actually exit the lake from a stream or a river. And this in turn, general, results in pretty long water residence times in the lake. In this particular scenario of a closed basin lake, then that long water residence time results in the process of evaporation really dominating or being very important to help explain changes in storage. Closed lakes are pretty common in arid to semi-arid regions. In addition to that, we might also expect to see closed basin lakes in areas of active rifting due to plate tectonics um, and the pooling apart of continental crust. And then we have an open lake in the bottom left. And so an open lake, in the case here, we have pretty high lake levels or overflowing conditions. And so surface outflow would exist, and that results, in general, in pretty short water residence time, uh, or short water residence time in the lake itself. So because the water flows in and flows out quite rapidly, evaporation isn't as important. And uh, we tend to see open lakes uh, in pretty humid and wet regions. Just a couple uh, brief examples of uh, open and closed basin lakes that you may have heard of or might be familiar with. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of an open lake, uh, one that I can think of um, is uh, in the English Lake District. I think this is the only um, lake district lake I've been to personally. 
and that's uh, Bazinthwaite, Bazinthwaite Lake. <clears throat> so that's an open lake in that the water uh, ends up moving in the lake and then out of the lake quite rapidly. And so in this case, evaporation, although it happens, it's not really uh, uh, dominating the hydrologic budget. Uh, in terms of a closed lake, a great example of that is in the uh, Great Basin in the western U.S. in the state of Utah, and that's the Great Salt Lake. So the Great Salt Lake is quite famous in that it uh, ends up precipitating or crystallizing lots of salt-type minerals, and that's because there is no surface overflow here, and water ends up hanging around in the system for a good amount of time. Evaporation uh, then ends up um, removing water that concentrates um, uh, ions in solution, and that causes uh, salt crystals and salt to precipitate in the system. Okay, so now we're going to talk briefly about the isotope hydrology of lakes. So um, the first thing that we have to acknowledge, and this makes perfect sense, is that lakes are filled with water, and uh, lake water is therefore a mixture of various water isotope molecules or isotope alongs. In our previous discussions, we've talked at length about the two most abundant and two most common of those being uh, H216O, and then we have H218O. And we've discussed how these two water isotope molecules or isotope logs will behave a little bit differently during phase changes in the water cycle, which is ultimately related to the mass difference um, of those two molecules. Okay, so back to the lake. Again, we've got a mixture of both molecules. Most of that water, by far and away, the vast majority of lake water will consist of h 216 <clears throat> However, there will be always a little bit of that heavier variety, h 218 So what we can do then is we can go to a lake and we can collect a sample of water and we can measure the relative abundance of the heavy isotopes and the light isotopes. We can then calculate a ratio or an R value. And the way we do that is we divide the heavy uh, relative abundance divided by the light relative abundance. And so we always do heavy divided by light, and that gives us again a R value. Last then, we calculate a delta value. And so if we're looking at oxygen isotopes, then we're calculating calculating what's called a delta 18 o value. And so that delta 18 o value is a function of the R value of the sample, and that's normalized to the R value of a reference standard. The reference standard that we use to measure water isotopes is called Vienna Standard Mean Ocean Water. It's got a very long name. And so if you have a mass spectrometer or another method of measuring isotopes, you'll have to get some of this reference material. Again, Vienna Standard Mean Ocean Water, or VSMO for short. You measure that um, at around the same time that you measure the unknown samples. And then we plug and chug using this equation right here. And that allows us then to correct or calibrate our uh, isotope abundance. So in this case, standards are very important because then we can compare our data from various geochemical labs around the world. Okay, so the last part I want to talk about then is how we can interpret the significance of the delta 18 o values, depending on if we have an open basin lake versus a closed basin lake. So on the left-hand side here, we've got this open basin lake. You can see that schematically it has a pretty high water level. We've got clouds and lots of rain is, uh, you know, being input to the system. So in the case of an open basin lake, we have water that's uh, quite rapidly moving through the system. Pretty short water residence time. In this case, evaporation doesn't really significantly modify the isotopic composition of lake water. That ends up, uh, in general, producing uh, pretty low delta values. <clears throat> and in turn, this records variations in the delta 18 value of the precipitation inputs. 
because of that rapid through flow, we don't have evaporation uh, modifying or fractionating the lake water. And the opposite then is the closed basin lake. So in the case of a closed basin lake, again, we don't have a surface outflow. There's a pretty long water residence time in the system. And that in turn results in evaporation being a much more dominant player to help understand uh, variations in water storage in the system. So in the case of the closed basin lake, we generally have much higher delta 18 values. And that's because of evaporation and uh, the preferential um, uh, transfer of the uh, lighter water molecule h 2 at the expense of h 2 So this results in much more positive or higher delta values in the system. And therefore, the delta 18 values in a closed basin lake are much more sensitive to, and they record variations in water balance or the precipitation minus evaporation balance, or more simply uh, due to changes in drought. Okay, so that's it for our lecture here on um, water stable isotopes and lakes. Here's our summary questions. Again, please review these and take a look. If you can answer these questions, um, then you'll get really the uh, most important concepts and the thrust of this material. All right, thanks for listening.